Hey guys, it's Paul from Online Tax Academy. In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at this incredible solo by Charlie Parker over the tune Cool Blues. Now, whether you're newer to sax or you're more of an advanced player, there's going to be loads in here for you to learn and take away from and apply it to your own playing. Listening and learning from these original recordings is one of the best ways to improve your sax playing. Now, the PDF we've got here is in concert pitch, and I haven't put the note names underneath just to keep it from being too cluttered. But over at Online Sax Academy, there's a link down below where you can get the free PDF with the note names written in as well. And premium members of Online Sax Academy will be able to get the alto sax and the tenor sax transposed versions of this as well. Now, Cool Blues is a standard 12 bar blues and it's in constant C. What this means is anything that you learn from this tune today, you can also apply to other blueses as well. And I really like this version in particular because they take it at a more medium tempo so you can really hear what's going on. And it's great to hear Parker play over these more relaxed tempos pose because his timing and phrasing is just amazing. All right, so first of all, we'll check out this first phrase here. All right, so the first thing to notice is there's lots of space in this phrase. You notice how you've got this quarter note here with a quarter note rest, we're ending right at the beginning of the measure here with all of this space afterwards. It's also really nicely balanced as well. This first phrase, we've got this ascending phrase going up. We're then staying in the middle here where we're enclosing this G and then we fall at the end there. In terms of the notes he's using, we've got one, three, four, five. What I mean by that is we're on a C7 chord and he's starting with a C. So that is known as the first degree. Then he goes to E, which is the third, the fourth is F, and then the G is the fifth. Now this shape, one, three, four, five, is a really common shape. And these four notes you can take out and just improvise with those. It's a really great group of notes to play around with. And you'll often hear phrases with things like this, where they're just using those four notes. Now for the second half of this phrase where it's slightly more flat in terms of the contour, he's using this really interesting technique here which is known as in an enclosure. We're targeting this note G and these two notes before are targeting there by going one above the G. So here's our G, we start on A flat just above, then we go just below to the F sharp and then we hit the G and that creates this really nice sound. He's then falling down to the third of the chord with that E, so we get... Let's have another listen to that phrase. All right, so let's move on and let's check out this second phrase, which starts from here and it's gonna finish here. Now for this second phrase, he's now starting on the highest note. The highest note of this phrase is the very first note. Whereas in the first phrase, the first note was the lowest note of that phrase. And so it's kind of flipping the shape and we have this descending shape that's kind of bumping down like this. Now, rhythmically, we've got this really nice pattern. We're starting on the and of one and we've got these two 16th notes, da -da -la, da -la, where we've got DCB and then CBA, the B's being flat. Have a quick listen. Now you could take that idea of playing these two 16th notes, starting on the offbeat, going down three notes, and then we go back up one note and code down three notes. We get this shape of, and you could keep going. And that would be a really nice exercise for your fingers to play down. And this could be with any scale in any key. Now there are some subtler melodic things going on here as well. In this descending part here, notice how there aren't any Fs. In the beginning of the phrase, he was using Fs. But here we've now got this shape of six, five, three, one. We've got the A, G, E, C. There's no Fs in those notes. And it's a very pentatonic -y sound. To complete the pentatonic, you just have to put the D in there. So we're coming down six, five, three, one. And then as we land on this F7 chord, that's when he reintroduces the F and finishes the phrase off. And that really um, spells out that change of chord. He's really playing the change there and ending on the note F. Let's have another listen to that second full phrase. Then after this busier measure here, where we've got these 16th notes, he's using space again, just to let the phrase breathe. Another really important thing that you can do when you're soloing as well. If you're gonna play a busier phrase, it's great to leave a few beats of space before you then come in again with your next phrase. And it gives the listener a chance to digest what they've just heard. All right, now for this third phrase, this is amazing. It's really hard to notate actually, because he's kind of pulling back on the time. So it's best just to listen to this lots to get the sense of where he's placed the notes. Have a listen to it. 
So we've got this really nice kind of stretched out triplet phrase. And the notes he's coming down here, you'll notice there's more flats coming in here. We've got E flats and B flats. These notes form what's called the C minor pentatonic scale. And that's the basis of our C minor blues scale. If you added in the F sharp there, you'd have the full blues scale. But without the F sharp, those notes are known as your C minor pentatonic scale. And the C minor pentatonic scale is a great set of notes to use when you're on F7, like in the context of a blues in C. Because we're in a blues in C, you're often gonna see this switch between the C major pentatonic sound, like we had up here in the second phrase, and the C minor pentatonic sound, like we've got here in this third phrase. But the thing that makes this really nice is he's crucially playing the change. As we move back to C7, we go back to E natural, and um, this is the third of C7, back to the one. So we go back to this major third. So we have this minor pentatonic sound when we're on the F7, moving back to, with that little grace note from the E flat to the E, just adds a bit of decoration to it as well. Yeah, check it out one more time. Now this coming back to the major third at the end of a bluesy run as the chord changes back to chord one. So here we're back to C7. That's a great thing to take away and have a practice of. Now for this fourth phrase, things are getting a bit more sophisticated in terms of their harmony. But before we dive into all of that, again, just looking at the shape of the phrase, you can see we're starting with this sweeping run up, which is a nice contrast to the previous phrase where we had this falling phrase coming down. And just taking this broader brushstroke look when you're looking at a trans description, you can still learn loads from it. You don't have to necessarily dive into the nitty gritty of every single note choice against every single chord. There's so much you can learn from where they're putting the space, what shapes of phrases they're using, what are some of the basic rhythms that they're using. That stuff is going to make your playing sound loads better as well. Yeah, check out this phrase here. <laughs> This is why Charlie Parker's a genius, because this stuff is so ultra modern. What we've got here is kind of like an E flat minor six kind of shape. And what that's doing is it's half a step above this D minor chord here. So you can think of this as like an E flat minor shape, E flat minor six. And then it's just sliding down to our D minor here, where, and he's just using five, one, two, three, just our typical shape that you could use to create that D minor sound. And the four notes before, we've got that E flat minor six. The other nice thing about this phrase is how you've almost got this descending line of this B flat is the high note here, and that's falling to the A, which is the high note here. You'll often find that the top notes of phrases are used as like guide tone lines. They're there for your ear to follow the shape of the phrase. So we've got this B flat falling to the A in the next phrase. All right, let's check out the final phrase of this first chorus. This is a classic Parker type phrase. There's quite a lot going on here. Um, the first thing I'll show you is this big enclosure again onto a G. It's a bit different to the previous enclosure we had up here, which was just a two note enclosure where we had two notes before leading to the G with now with this one, we've got a th what's known as a three note enclosure. We've got that A flat and F sharp still, but we've got this F as well. We've got one semitone above A flat, and then we walk into that G here. So we have, yeah, check that out one more time. Now that last phrase is so soulful where you've got that four to three falling. This is coming back to that same uh, phrase idea we had at the beginning with this one, three, four, five shape. Now he's just taking the one, the four and the three and playing around with that. Now this four falling down to the three is a really common idea. It sounds really nice. Um, and you can think of it as what's known as a suspension. Basically a, a major triad, one, three, five, makes a major chord. Now if we turn the three into a four, we get this what's known as a sus chord. Now this sus chord falling back to a major arpeggio is a really common sound. And that's kind of what's happening in this phrase. Have another listen. <laughs> 
and yet again loads of space it's what gives this kind of feel of confidence late and being laid back i mean the tune is called cool blues so it, it kind of goes with the title of it it's this nice really laid back bluesy feel and there's lots of chance to breathe listen to the phrases he's just played and kind of take in what he's doing now for the start of the second and final chorus we get this amazing phrase here check this out <laughs> We've got this amazing run up here and this doubling of the high note when you get up somewhere like this. It's a great way to really establish that high note melodically. It kind of gives it more emphasis. The notes he's using, these are all coming from our C major pentatonic scale. And he's not even playing the D, so you can even just think of this as a C major arpeggio plus the A for this very bright and light sound. And after this big sweeping phrase up, we get the nice balance of it falling back down again here. And as he's coming down, you can see here's our flattened third, this bluesy note. Now that introduces a bit of tension and that gets resolved here where he comes back to that E natural again at the beginning of the bar and he's holding it to really establish it. <laughs> It's also putting a bit of a scoop, a bit of a bend into that note. That's a really nice thing to do when you're landing on these thirds. Because the blues note is just below, you can kind of bend into these notes and play around with that. Because if you go flat, it's just turning it bluesy. And that's a really nice technique to use. Now, this next phrase, you can really hear the influence of players like Lester Young in his playing in this one. Have a listen to this. <laughs> Now, Lester Young liked to use this shape here. Um, this is technically called an augmented shape. But the easiest way I like to think about it is you've basically got a C major chord, C, E, G. Now, if you take the G and move it up a semitone, you get this kind of more tense sound of a C augmented or C sharp five. And importantly, the way that gets resolved, that A flat it is pulling, it wants to pull back down to a G and so that's where this G comes from here and that's what resolves that phrase. Have another listen. Now interestingly he's got exactly the same phrase in measure 18 here as he did in measure 6 with just the G F and just taking simple phrase ideas like that you can say when I'm playing a blues for the next couple of choruses every time I land on chord four I'm just going to play this simple little phrase and what I'm going to improvise is getting into that G F in lots of different ways so here he's using that augmented triad coming down and here he had this more kind of 16th note pattern coming down again loads of space giving the phrase plenty of chance to breathe before we get our next phrase here which goes like this <laughs> Now this phrase looks fairly straightforward at first, but there's some subtle little things in here which are really great, what make it sound so melodic. First of all, you've got this F resolving down onto the E, so we're hitting that third right on the beginning of the phrase. And these four notes, again, you can think of these as coming from our C minor pentatonic, just like up here where we were coming down the C minor pentatonic. He's using that same scale here with C, B flat, G, F. If you were to continue that sound down, those are your most likely choices, E flat and C. So he's got those four notes, and then we're resolving to the major third as we go into our C7 bar. But then we get this curious note here. Now, B natural, you may be thinking, but we're on a C7 chord, and in C7, surely we have B flats. And this is another reason why Charlie Parker's a genius. Uh, what's going on here is that B natural, just that one note, is really bringing in the sound of like a, what would be a, a short 2-5, an E minor 7 going A7, which is setting up this D minor here. If you take these notes here of E, G and B, we've got... Those are the E minor triad notes and it's really setting up this sound in the listener's ear of an E minor which was a typical thing to do of this measure in the blues to set up this final 251. All right now he's leaving a good amount of space here before we come in with the final phrases and notice how this phrase 
the final phrase of his solo starts with the highest note he's played so far of this solo. This is also probably the most dense in terms of number of notes. He's saved that towards the end of the solo. He's kind of built up to it. Check it out. Now what he's playing here is coming shooting down that is if we go in reverse order D F A C E is 1 3 5 7 9 those are basically just the chord tones but shh, coming down in reverse order we then have another typical idea of his where this B is kind of anticipating is the third of this G7 shooting right up to this is known as the flat 9 and we he uses those ideas all the time we had it earlier on here where you've got this B to A flat this that's a typical Parker phrase and here we've got it's a similar idea, but he's kind of adding in this um, decoration here. And after these more challenging ideas here with these fast arpeggios and flat nine intervals, he just ends it nice and simply, bringing it right back home to C. We're in blues in C after all, brings it home to the one with this simple phrase of. Now you could just take that one phrase, three, five, six, one, and take that and put it through a few different keys. Like for example, if I did it in F major, or B flat major, I'm just applying the same numbers, three, five, six, one, and doing it in different keys. And just these little simple ideas like this is what I would start with if you haven't learned language before. You don't wanna start off by learning some long and blistering phrase like this, taking little fragments like this four notes here and learning them in a few different keys. It opens up your ears and it's much more manageable as well. You'll find you'll be much more easily be able to assimilate it into your improvising. And then the very final phrase, Parker often does this, this kind of could easily be the end phrase. You kind of have almost like an afterthought phrase. It sounds like this. Where again, we're bringing it home. We're ending on a chord tone, the third again. So often it's ending on the third or ending on the root with phrases. Those are some of the most stable chord tones to bring phrases home to. Also the phrase length as well is just a nice compliment. We've got a short one measure phrase here after we've had this much longer three measure phrase before. And that's a slightly more advanced concept with dealing with three measure and one measure phrases. But it's something you can play around with is the phrase length because that will also have an effect on the sound. All right, so we'll listen to this whole last chorus so you can hear how all these phrases work together. <laughs> So there's so many nice phrases in here, so many nice ideas that you can take from and start to use in your own playing. Now remember you can get the free PDF of this concert pitch version both with and without note names and the link is below and premium members you can download the alto sax and tenor sax transposed versions as well. And if you're interested in learning how to improvise do check out the learn to improvise course at onlinesaxacademy.com. Premium members have access to all the courses on the site including that. Let me know in the comments down below if there's any other solos you'd like me to check out and analyze like this and I'll see you guys soon.